1948. For Palestinians, that year is a Nakba, or the catastrophe. When hundreds of thousands were forced out of their homes, For Israelis, that year marks the creation of the State of Israel. As a filmmaker and as a Palestinian, this documentary series was my way to understand the events of the past that are still shaping the present. Our story starts here in 1799, outside the walls of Acre in Ottoman-controlled Palestine. An army under Napoleon Bonaparte besieged the city, all part of a campaign to defeat the Ottomans and establish a French presence in the region. In search of allies, Napoleon issued a letter offering Palestine as a homeland to the Jews under French protection. He called on the Jews to rise up against what he called their oppressors. Napoleon's appeal was widely publicized, but he was ultimately defeated. In Acre today, the only memory of him is a statue atop a hill overlooking the city. Yet Napoleon's project for a Jewish homeland in the region under a colonial protectorate did not die. Forty years later, the plan was revived by the British, this time as a means of thwarting the rising power of Egyptian governor Muhammad Ali. In 1840, British Foreign Secretary Lord Palmerston wrote to his ambassador in Constantinople, urging him to convince the Sultan and his entourage to open Palestine for the immigration of Jews. At that time, there were estimated to be no more than 3,000 Jews in Ottoman-controlled Palestine. Over the years, Jewish immigration to Palestine increased, helped on by wealthy benefactors. One of these was the French aristocrat, Baron Edmund de Rothschild. He began visiting Palestine in the 1880s and became one of the Jewish community's leading sponsors. He spent over 14 million French francs to establish 30 Jewish settlements. The most important was Richon Le Zion, founded in 1882. Today, the remains of Baron de Rothschild lie in a mausoleum in northern Israel. It's a popular site for Israeli schoolchildren learning about the wealthy patron who bankrolled Jewish settlement building in Palestine over 100 years ago. In 1885, the term Zionism was first coined by Austrian writer Nathan Birnbaum. It's derived from the word Zion, one of the biblical names for Jerusalem. Zionism came to mean the establishment of a Jewish homeland in Palestine, but not all Jews supported this. أما اليهود اللي أجوا من أوروبا خصوصا من شرق أوروبا هذيك الوقت في أواخر القرن التسعة عشر كان بدهم يبنوا سهيوني يهودي جديد 
In 1896, Theodor Herzl, an Austro-Hungarian journalist, wrote a book called The Jewish State. It is considered one of the most important texts of early Zionism. Herzl envisioned the founding of a future independent Jewish state during the 20th century. His colleague, Max Nordau, sent two rabbis to Palestine to investigate the prospects for a Jewish state there. Their report concluded, the bride is beautiful, but she is married to another man. The rabbis understood that Palestine's spouse was the Palestinian society rooted in its soil. In 1897, Herzl with Birnbaum and Nordau convened the first Zionist Congress in the Swiss city of Basel. The Congress adopted a program for the establishment of a homeland for the Jewish people in Palestine. حتى تحمي واحدة منها تحمي هذا الكيان فهذا هو أبو الدولة الصهيونية ما في شك لكنه ليس مبدع الفكر الصهيوني هو معقد مؤتمر لهذه الدول معا واتفقت الدول على دعمه هو كان يثير تنافس بين دولة وأخرى كان يكذب على دولة أنه أنا سأكون معكم إذا أسستم دولة إسرائيل ضد الدول الأخرى أنا أؤمن مصالحكم على حساب مصالح الدول الأخرى In 1907, the British government set up a committee to devise a strategy toward the Muslim Arab population of the Ottoman Empire. The committee's report, submitted to British Prime Minister Henry Campbell Bannerman in 1907, recommended establishing a so-called buffer state in Palestine. The report proposed this state be hostile to its neighbors and friendly to Europe. The aim was to divide the region and so assure Britain's continued imperial dominance. بحيث أن هذا الجسم يكون معتمد على الاستعمار الغربي ويعتمد على على الأوروبيين هذا الجسم ضمان بقائه أن يكون ما حوله ضعيفا. في كمان فكر عند الأوروبيين إنه اليهود مقربين لهم أكثر من العرب وإذا تكون هون دولة يهودية بيكون أفضل لهم In 1907, Chaim Weissman, a chemist who had emerged as a leader among British Zionists, visited Palestine for the first time. He set out to establish a company in Jaffa to develop the land of Palestine, a practical means to pursue the Zionist dream of building a Jewish state. His venture was supported by Baron de Rothschild. Within three years, a major deal was struck. The Jewish National Fund, set up to buy land in Palestine, purchased some 10,000 dunams in the Maj bin Amma region of northern Palestine. The sale to the Jewish National Fund had dire consequences for the thousands of Palestinian farmers living on the land. أكثر من 60 ألف فلسطيني في منطقة مرج بن عامر إذا كانت النكبة تعني ترحيل الإنسان الفلسطيني من أرضه والاستيلاء على أرضه في القوة ضمن هذول المركبين فحقيقة النكبة بدأت عشرات سنين قبل 48 A more uh, drastic form of colonialism than the average classical European colonialism in the sense that their purpose was actually not so much only to exploit the locals, but uh, to drive them out. From the very early moment that the Zionist movement uh, targeted Palestine uh, as the, the place for Jewish independence and statehood, and it was clear that there were Palestinians on the land, uh, the Zionist leaders and common people alike were got used to the idea that the only way of uh, making Palestine a Jewish state is by uh, causing the Palestinians to leave. إخلاء الفلاحين هو تطبيق للمبدأين من ناحية الاستيلاء على الأرض تسمى تهويد الأرض 
وثانيا العمل العبري وهو الاستعادة عن فلاحين عرب بيهود إما من شرق أوروبا وفي حالات أخرى عندما قل العدد استعانوا بيهود من اليمن A Jewish militia known as Hashemir was established to protect the growing number of Jewish settlements. Jews held demonstrations to demand the recognition of Hebrew as an official language under Ottoman rule. The Arab and the Palestinian were one day from the first day to the first day to the Zionists. It was a movement of the Zionists to talk about the land to the land وتوظيف البعد الديني لجعلها وطن لمن تبقى منها يهود العالم في هوية وكيان ومستقبل سياسي هذا الوعي كان واضح جدا عن نجيب عزوري كان واضح جدا عن نجيب نصار In 1908, Najib Nassar, a Palestinian pharmacist, began publishing a newspaper called Al Carmel. In it, he warned of Zionism as a movement aimed at displacing the Palestinians. He wrote the Jewish state would be a poisonous dagger in the heart of the Arabs. The outbreak of World War I in 1914 created new opportunities to reshape the Middle East. خلال الحرب البريطانيين كان يفكروا عن الموقع يعني فلسطين على قرب من قناة سويس ودور بريطانيا في مصر أنذاك كان يدل على دور خاص لبريطانيا في فلسطين ورأوا في اليهود وفي الحركة الصهيونية شريك في أمر استراتيجي استعماري. In 1915, a secret memorandum was presented to the British cabinet under the title "The Future of Palestine." It was drafted by Herbert Samuel, a British politician and Zionist committed to Palestine becoming a home for the Jewish people. In the document, Samuel advised that the time was not ripe for the establishment of an autonomous Jewish state in Palestine. He recommended instead that Palestine be annexed to the British Empire, describing this as the most welcome solution to the supporters of the Zionist movement. He expressed the hope that under British rule and over time, more Jews would settle in the land and grow into a majority, among what he called the Mohammedans of Arab race. Samuel's recommendations were taken into account in the secret British-French agreement formulated by British politician Sir Mark Sykes and French diplomat François-Georges Picot. The Sykes-Picot agreement opened the way for the establishment of a Jewish state. In 1917, the British cabinet, headed by Prime Minister David Lloyd George, pledged to establish a homeland for the Jews in Palestine. The pledge came in the form of a letter from the British Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour to the influential British Zionist Lord Walter Rothschild. Balfour can you mathel al hukuma al britaniya wallama kataba risalatu ila Lord Rothschild kan yaktub bi ism al hukuma al britaniya Rothschild كان يلعب دور شخصي لوبي ليشجع الحكومة البريطانية أن تأخذ سياسة معينة بالنسبة إلى دور اليهود في فلسطين فكان يمثل الحركة الصهيونية ووراء كلهم خيم بايزمان اللي كان المسؤول بالنسبة للـ World Zionist Organization أو المنظمة الدولية الصهيونية Britain had no moral or political or legal right to promise the land that belonged to the Arabs to another people. So the Balfour Declaration was both immoral and illegal. A month after Balfour's pledge, a meeting took place in London to celebrate the declaration. Speakers included Lord Rothschild, Herbert Samuel, Mark Sykes, and Chaim Weissman. Just several days later, on December the 11th, 1917, the British Army, commanded by General Edmund Allenby, captured Jerusalem.
Entering the Holy City alongside Allenby was a Jewish military unit, established under British auspices. One member of this unit was David Ben-Gurion, who would later be Israel's first prime minister. The unit also included Ze'ev Jabotinsky, a future Zionist leader, as well as Nehemiah Rabin, soon to be father of young boy Yitzhak Rabin. Within a month, General Allenby welcomed Chaim Weissman in Jerusalem. There were approximately 50,000 Jews in Palestine at this time, 10% of the population among half a million Arabs. The Great War ended in 1918, and preparations were made for a peace conference in Paris. President of the United States, Woodrow Wilson, commissioned an investigation into the non-Turkish areas of the former Ottoman Empire. The commission was headed by the academic, Dr. Henry King, and the politician, Charles Crane. When it was eventually published, the Crane-King report proved to be political dynamite. The report stated that the non-Jewish population of Palestine, nearly nine-tenths of the whole, was emphatically against the Zionist program. The report went on to warn that anti-Zionist feeling in Palestine and Syria was intense and not likely to be flouted. It divulged conversations with British officers who suggested a force of not less than 50,000 soldiers would be required to initiate the Zionist program. The authors judged all this as evidence of what they described as a strong sense of the injustice of the Zionist program. The report concluded, Jewish immigration should be definitely limited, and the project for making Palestine distinctly a Jewish commonwealth should be given up. The Crane King report fell on deaf ears. At the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, Britain was represented by Prime Minister David Lloyd George and Arthur Balfour. A delegation from the Zionist organization attended, headed by Chaim Weissman. They presented a map, seen here, proposing the area to be allocated for a Jewish homeland. The map included both Palestine and the east bank of the Jordan River, as well as parts of what are today southern Lebanon and Syria. Parallel to the conference, the leader of the Arab delegation, Prince Faisal bin Hussein, signed with the Zionist delegation's leader what became known as the faisal weissman Agreement. It outlined Faisal's approval for a Jewish homeland in Palestine and an Arab nation in the larger Middle East. The agreement was mediated by Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Edward Lawrence, known as Lawrence of Arabia. Faisal signed, adding in his own handwriting, that the agreement be dependent on the Arabs gaining their independence. The يعني مضبوط لنا علاقات كثير كويسه في لندن في لنا لنا مكتب في في نيويورك وواشنطن ولنا ناس في برلين وفي باريس والاخير بس احنا في هون ناس واحنا لازم او نتفق معهم بس نجي لشيء معهم لازم ناخذهم بعين الاعتبار على الاقل و1919 اسسوا مركز استخباري للحركه الصهيونيه 1919. <laughs> نوع نوع واحد معلومات سياسية شو الرأي العام هل بدهم يوافقوا مع المشروع الصهيوني أو لا وين في أراضي فاضية وين في ناس ممكن يبيعوا أراضي لليهود هذا كان الإشي الثاني حكي الثالث من نقدر نقول كان إذا في خطة لمهاجمة يهود بمنطقة معينة يكون واحد يقول لك يعني جماعة قعدوا عندنا وحكوا بكرة بدنا نروح عن مستوطنة معينة ومع بروده in 1920, the first British High Commissioner for Palestine was appointed. 
Controversially, London selected Herbert Samuel for the post. Samuel was a committed Zionist. Many suspected he would set out to implement what he had proposed five years earlier by favoring Jewish immigration to transform Palestine into a Jewish homeland. In 1922, the League of Nations formalized British rule in Palestine. The second clause of the British Mandate document approved by the League of Nations stipulated, the British mandatory shall be responsible for placing the country under political, administrative, and economic conditions that will secure the establishment of the Jewish national home. British High Commissioner Herbert Samuel decreed Hebrew as an official language of Palestine alongside Arabic and English. The letters E and Y were added to the word Palestine in Hebrew as an abbreviation of the words Eretz Yisrael, meaning land of Israel. Herbert Samuel, under the British Empire, was the one who created Israel. He was the one who created the law for 100 laws to allow the Jews to the Arab people to the Jews. Second, سمح لليهود بأن يكون لهم نظام تعليم منفصل عن نظام حكومة فلسطين وأهم ما عمله الإنجليز أن سمحوا لهم بأن يكون لهم جيش منفصل أنا أتكلم عن 1920 Britain provided the muscle um, under which they could simply emigrate I mean they couldn't have emigrated were it not for uh, the British presence um, because the, the, um, the crucial battle in the early stages was simply getting Jews into Palestine and acquiring land. They couldn't have done that without uh, British uh, government's um, sponsorship. The British government took the most important thing and the most important thing to the government and the government to the Sultan of the British government. كانت تعطي منح اراضي لليهود حتى يسوي الكبوسات وهالشغلات هاي كلها. واحنا نشوف هالاشياء مش ما نشوفها لكن ما نوعاهاش. يعني انا في جيلي في هذاك الوقت. وحمل الوكاله اليهوديه التي كانت شبه حكومه لليهود ايام الانتداب واعطوها كل المساعدات العسكريه والماديه وساعدوا على اخفاء نفسها. فهي مهارة صهيونية مؤامرة بريطانية وإلى حد ما وآسف أن أقول غباء أو بساطة عربية فلسطينية Palestinians viewed the British mandatory authority and British troops on the ground as siding with the Jews. More and more Palestinian farmers, expelled from farmlands, began to join newly formed revolutionary groups. In 1921, Palestinians organized large demonstrations against Jewish immigration. At that time, the Palestinian leadership was in effect hereditary within one family. The Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Amin al-Husseini, inherited his position at the age of 25, following the death of his brother, who had in turn succeeded their father. The leadership sent successive delegations to London to discuss the Palestinian question. الحركة الوطنية الفلسطينية في الوطن كانت تعمل على أن تجمع الصيف والشتاء تحت سقف واحد الحفاظ على صداقة بريطانيا في جانب ومعاداة الحركة الصهيونية في جانب آخر وهذا لا يمكن أن يستقيم نخبة دقيقة جدا رقيقة جدا بالعدد يعني وبالتعليم تقابل نخبة إمبراطوريات يعني اليهود في بداية القرن العشرين نخب إمبراطوريات نخب إمبراطوريات فعلا يعني تقريبا في كل منطقة 
وكل لقاء لقاء للمؤسسات الفلسطينيه اللي اسست هذيك الفتره اللي 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 مثلا اللجنه المسيحيه المسلميه المسلميه وكل المؤسسات والمجلس الاسلامي اعلى والهيئه الاسلاميه كل المؤسسات بعد كم من ساعه من الجلسه كان في تكرير لليهود هيك وهيك حكوا هذا رايه هيك وهذا ممكن تشتغلوا معه هذا عدو لكم وهذا ممكن تشتروه بالمال والى اخره وتكرير يعني موجوده بالارشيف الصهيوني The changes on the ground in Palestine can be noted in the British government's report to the Council of the League of Nations in 1925. The document reported the immigration of more than 33,000 Jews who were granted Palestinian nationality. This was three times the figure of the previous year. 13 new settlements were built according to the report. A Jewish labor union called the Histadrut had been set up under the direction of David Ben-Gurion, and the Jewish town of Tel Aviv was accorded municipal autonomy. In addition, the Hebrew University was officially opened in 1925 at a ceremony attended by British High Commissioner Herbert Samuel, the former British Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour, and the head of the Zionist organization, Chaim Weissman. As Weissman's guest, Balfour visited a number of Jewish settlements. In Jerusalem, he met with Samuel and Allenby, the two men who had helped implement the policy he himself had laid out eight years earlier in the famous Balfour Declaration. The Palestinians went on strike to protest against Balfour's visit. They raised black flags to signal their opposition to the policies Balfour had set in train. The Palestinians were in somber mood. Not so the Zionists. The story of the famous Sayyid Amir Khalid has three hijabs. The Sayyid of the Quds has one hijab that is not visible under the hijab. And the Christian Messiah has no hijab. وماشيين مع بعض وراحوا على بيت المندوب السامي واحتجوا واعترضوا. Weissman congratulated Samuel for his work towards the establishment of a national Jewish homeland. The Zionist movement was active in its propaganda. This film, in French, showed the map of Palestine with areas highlighted as land the Zionists claimed to have acquired as of 1925. The film also shows the areas Zionists planned to acquire within the next 25 years. In the summer of 1929, Ardent Zionist groups organized a gathering at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, known to the Palestinians as Al Burak. The incident ignited violent demonstrations called the Burak Revolt, led by a Palestinian farmer named Farhan Al Sadi. More than 100 Arabs and Jews were killed on both sides. Sir John Chancellor, the new British High Commissioner in Palestine, issued a strongly worded memorandum calling for all those who took part in the revolt to be severely punished. Three Palestinians were arrested and accused of participating in the revolt. They were Fuad Hassan Hijazi from Safad, Atta Ahmed Al-Zir from Hebron, and Mohammed Khalil Jamjoum, whose picture could not be found. The three men were jailed here at Acre Prison. The British sentenced them to death. Arab delegations pleaded for their sentences to be commuted. But on June the 17th, 1930, the British authorities had the three men executed. A cemetery in Acre still contains the graves of the three men. In a final statement before their execution, they had written, at the end of our lives, we say to the Arab leaders, and Muslims all over the world do not trust the foreigners. We lived and died for the Arab cause. <laughs>
Such sentiments of anti-colonialism and pan-Arabism would become increasingly common in subsequent decades. During the first 10 years of the British mandate, the number of Jews in Palestine more than doubled to reach 175,000. Zionists all over the world were proud of their achievement. I am here today to ask you, my fellow Zionists, which attitude shall we take? Which of the possible attitudes that we face shall be our own? I would say to England, though I am only an American Jew, but an old-time reverencing admirer of Great Britain, I would say to England, if I could, an Arab Palestine is a threat to Great Britain and a menace to the world. A Jewish Palestine is an asset to Great Britain and a blessing to the world. Ladies and gentlemen, the toast is health and long life to the right honorable Lloyd George. With Chaim Weissman beside him, former British Prime Minister David Lloyd George reaffirmed his own Zionist credentials. It is as your chairman has reminded you, it is nearly 16 years since he recruited me to the Zionist movement. <laughs> Palestine, barren and malarial swamps have been converted into happy settlements. Science has been harnessed to waters which had been running wild and waste since the early days of creation. Without vegetation and without life, Empty desolation, that is Palestine. British news bulletins at the time described Palestine as akin to a desert. The reality was very different. تطلع الصبح تروحي على المكساء تحد ريحة الخضرة تفحفح نوار على الخيار نوار على البقوس هالبندورة ها الحبة عيفة في الشي بعد عيفة بتذكرها مية في المية إم الدنيا بكت عيفة بالنسبة لي طبعا هي أجمل مدينة بل أجمل مكان في العالم المسيح لم يقم في مدينة طبعا إنما أقام حول المدينة فيها عمل معظم معجزاته على مياه مشا. British politicians of the early 20th century had a distorted view of Palestinian society frequently labeling it as Mohammedan, despite the population including over 100,000 Palestinian Christians. They did not regard them as yet belonging to either an Arab national group in general or to local national groups. Uh, the only way they were able to view them was as a religious 
uh, uh, group of believers. So I think they, they missed the point, for instance, that um, Christians and Muslims actually f uh, founded a new identity, uh, not a religious one, but a national one. حالة المسيحيين الشرقيين غير موجودة هنالك مأزق لدى الاستعمار عندما يستخدم التيولوجيا المسيحية في الرؤية المنطقة والشرق الأوسط اللي أدت إلى تبني الصهيونية فيما بعد مأزق التعامل مع المسيحية الشرقية يعني هذه تشكل مش موجودة في عالمه ولذلك يحاول أنه ينكر وجودها أصلا يعني لأنه مجرد وجودها بتربك كل الصورة By 1933, protests against Jewish immigration were becoming ever more frequent in Palestine. Women took part side by side with men. The British authorities cracked down on demonstrations and arrested thousands. Many were killed and wounded. Musa Kazim al Husseini, the 80 year old former mayor of Jerusalem, was beaten by British soldiers during a demonstration in Jaffa. He later died of his injuries. The British authorities became ever more heavy handed. This letter was written by a Palestinian policeman condemning the behavior of his British senior officer, John Faraday. A number of other complaints were filed against Faraday. The officer was never charged. Four years later, Faraday was awarded the King's Police Medal for his valuable services in Palestine. Adam. رغبة بريطانيا بمنح المطالب الوطنية للشعب الفلسطيني وعدم رؤيتها للشعب الفلسطيني كمجموعة قومية وطنية ذات حقوق ومعاملات على أساس إنها طوائف أدى في حين عاملت الوكالة اليهودية على أساس أنها ممثلة لمجموعة قومية كل هذا مجتمعا أدى إلى تفاقم الوضع والصدام مع بريطانيا only still images of the Palestinian demonstrations are available in the archives. Movie cameras did capture Jewish life in Palestine, as well as British pomp and ceremony. This footage shows the Star of David flag over the Tel Aviv municipality building. This is footage of work in the diamond factories of Tel Aviv. And this footage shows the flow of new immigrants and the building of new settlements. Footage of Palestinian life in the early 20th century proved more difficult to find. A Palestinian film archive had once existed, but had since been lost or gone mysteriously missing. We spent months searching for pictures of Palestinian lives. Eventually, in the vaults of the British Library, we found glimpses of this bygone era. Most of the Palestinians, intellectuals, leaders, journalists, were still unaware how determined the Zionist movement is of dispossessing them from Palestine. In the 1930s, the number of Jews immigrating to Palestine began to increase significantly. From 4,000 in 1931, the figure jumped to 9,500 the following year. In 1933, the number rose to 30,000. In 1934, 42,000, and in 1935, a further jump to 62,000. 
That same year, Palestinian poet Abdul Rahim Mahmoud wrote a poem which he read aloud to Prince Saud bin Abdul Aziz of Saudi Arabia, who was visiting Jerusalem. He asked, did you come to visit the Holy Aqsa Mosque or to bid it farewell before it is lost? عندما ارسل القسام للقياده الفلسطينيه في القدس ليستشيرهم في الثوره قالوا انه نحن الوقت غير مناسب لاعلان ثوره الشعب غير ناضج لاعلان الثوره وقالوا ايضا اننا ما زلنا نحن نراهن على امكانيه الحصول على حقوقنا من خلال المفاوضات السياسيه شيخ ايز الدين القسام established a revolutionary group to strike at zionist and british targets in 1935, in the hills near Janine, he and a small band of men were surrounded by British forces. Making a defiant stand, Al Qassam and those with him were killed. حركه القسام لم تحظى بالاهتمام الكثير من جانب المؤرخين ولا نعرف عنها الكثير بسبب الغموض التي اكتنفها وبسبب الحرص الشديد للشيخ عز الدين القسام على سريه العمل وعدم اطلاع الكثيرين الا الصفوه الصغيره من طلابه امتدت روح عز الدين القسام في الوسط الفلسطيني وتاثر بها كثير من الفلسطينيين فبدات مشاعر الانقلاب او التمرد على الاستعمار البريطاني تظهر في صفوف الشعب الفلسطيني the Palestinian political leadership came under pressure to halt negotiations with the British. Palestinian poet Ibrahim Tukan addressed a poem to the leadership in 1935. A poem dripping with irony. Oh, you sincere patriots, you who carry the heavy burden of the cause, only a fragment of the country remains for us. So please step down before the remaining parts fly away. On April the 19th, 1936, Palestinian anger boiled over. Protests erupted in the city of Jaffa in coordination with a general strike. The wave of anger spread throughout Palestine. The reasons for the protests were explained by a spokesman for the Palestinian political leadership. The main case of the Arabs is against the British government's policy in Palestine. A policy which, if continued, will surely have as a result the replacement of the Arabs by the Jews. Against all principles, the British government imposed the Balfour Declaration, which is abhorred by all Arabs in the Near East, and on favoring the establishment of a national home for Jews, forgot intentionally to safeguard the civil rights of the non-Jewish population. The Arabs, who decided on a general and a complete strike until the total and immediate stoppage of Jewish emigration is brought about and until the government introduces an essential change in its present policy. When the Arabs were the most important Arabs in the history of the Arabs, the Arabs of the 36th century, all Palestine were Arabs. And this came to the result of the النضالات اللي صارت في السابق في مواجهة الانتداب حكم الانتداب وتحيز الانتداب مع اليهود وتمكينهم من تسهيل الأمور عليهم في كل شيء. The 1936 revolt shocked the British mandatory authorities who carried out harsh punitive actions. Anyone suspected of links with the revolutionaries was arrested their homes destroyed. In Jaffa alone, more than 200 houses were demolished as a collective punishment. Demolitions in other villages and cities followed. The British insisted that destroying Palestinian houses was justified as a means to end the revolt. What do you remember about English? English! English! Put them in the house, put them in 
حطوا المركز بل هذا على الطريق مما فات خالي إله خالي ماخذ الشغيري تبعه فاهمي قال له لفوت أنت والشغيري تبعك بدك تكنس المركز قال له أنا ماخذ شغيرتي ضربوه لما ضربوه ضربوه لريمون اسمه ريمون الضابط تمون يقتلوا لمات أخذناه عملوا عملية على حيفا في مستشفى حمزة في قريم بهذا هذا لقالوا من الضرب هون مديل السحم رايح زايب ومات بأكو لهلبونا شو يعملوا؟ ايه يقتلوا الزلام ويأخذوهم على السجن على تركال على شرشور هذا البلد ولا شرشور هذا عند بنيامين هاي يحبسوهم هناك شهر شهرين وشغلوهم في المحاجر شغال الشاقة وجبوهم هان على نور شمس على المحاجر شغال الشاقة إذا بتقري مذكرات بن غوريون كان يتحدى يتحدى مفاوضه العربي في قمة الثورة في قمة ال 36 في جلساته مع موسى العلمي اللي رتبها واكهوب المندوب السامي قال له احنا إن حضور فعلي لا يستطيع الغربي ببريطانيا ان تقول لنا لا من انتم في بريطانيا During the Arab revolt David Ben Gurion then a prominent leader of the Zionist movement reportedly made a startling suggestion to the British High Commissioner Arthur Warhol Ben Gurion is said to have suggested all Palestinians expelled from their land by Jewish settlement building should be resettled in neighboring Transjordan. The British High Commissioner is reported to have replied that this was, in his words, a good idea. <laughs>